Rabbi Fieldman was having trouble with his congregation. So they clearly weren't like you because you're lovely. They couldn't agree on anything. And the president of the congregation said, Rabbi, this can't continue. We must have a conference and we must settle these matters once and for all. At the appointed time, the rabbi, the president and ten elders met around a magnificent mahogany table in the conference room of the synagogue. One by one, the issues were dealt with. And on each issue, it became more and more apparent that the rabbi was a lone voice in the wilderness. The president of the synagogue said, Come, rabbi, enough of this. Let's vote and allow the majority to rule. He passed out slips of paper, and each man made his mark. The votes were collected, and the president said, You may examine them. Rabbi, it's 11 to 1 against you. We have the majority. Offended, the rabbi rose to his feet and said, so now you think because of the vote that you're right and I'm wrong. Well, that's not so. I stand here, and he raised his arms impressively, and he looked heavenward, and I call upon the Holy One of Israel to give us a sign that I'm right. And you are wrong. No sooner were the words out of his mouth when there was a deafening clap of thunder and a brilliant flash of lightning that struck the mahogany table and cracked it in two. The room was filled with smoke and fumes and the president and the elders were hurled to the floor. Surrounded by the rubble, the rabbi stood erect and untouched, his eyes flashing with just a hint of triumph. Slowly, the president lifted himself from the rubble. His hair was singed. His glasses were hanging from one ear. His clothing was in disarray. Finally, he said, all right, 11 to 2, but we still have the majority. (laughs) Thankfully, the things which unite us as Christians are many more than those which divide us. But I began with that story because our scripture reading also contains a dramatic divine intervention. The early church were being persecuted by those who either didn't understand or didn't want to understand the good news of the gospel. And it's sad to recognize that in many places the church is still persecuted today. Saul was there when the persecution really kicked off. Acts 7 tells us that when Stephen was stoned, Saul was a young man. And although he wasn't physically involved, he minded the coat of those who were there and were involved. And if that tacit approval is enough, we're told in chapter 8, verse 1, that Saul approved of their killing him. There's perhaps a tendency to see Saul as a villain and the converted Paul as a mighty man of God. But many of the characteristics are the same. If you were looking to employ someone, what are the things about Saul that stand out? His drive, his determination, his organization. He took letters with him when he went to Damascus. None of this where we have today, the number of times you walk into a supermarket, I'm sorry, fellas, but it's you. And you get into a supermarket and they're they're saying, where's the sugar? (laughs) No, they haven't got any of that. What else else do you want me to get? Saul couldn't do any of that, but he, he had the organization to take with him all that he needed for what he had planned. And so we find Saul on the road to Damascus with murder on his mind. Not the impulsive fly off the handle in a moment of madness sort of mindset. Planned, organized, cold, blooded. Saul was intent on suppressing the followers of Christ. It was ridiculous to suggest that the religious authorities had killed the Messiah. Things were going to get out of hand if radical steps weren't taken. And Saul was happy to take them. 
But although Saul had murder on his mind, God had other ideas. Sometimes, perhaps even often, God speaks to us in spite of ourselves. Saul wasn't meditating on God's word. He hadn't come into the majesty of God's presence in one of those special moments of peace. Seeking God was the last thing on his mind. But God stepped in anyway. We are imperfect, broken vessels. There are times when we know exactly what is important and our lives mirror what God asks. But there are also times when we are at best hesitant to follow and at other times our responses might range from disobedience to a deliberate failure to listen. Two men were talking one day. One of them said, my wife talks to herself a lot. His friend answered, mine does too, but she doesn't know it. She thinks I'm listening. <laughs> Sometimes, perhaps, we disregard God in the same way. Do we expect a Damascus Road-style appearance if he's got anything important to say to us? Perhaps sometimes we need to take Eli's advice to the young Samuel and say, speak God, your servant is listening. We often speak of that Damascus Road experience, that moment where God intervened in Saul's life in such a way that he realized the power and perhaps more importantly, the love and the grace of God. The Damascus Road experience has become synonymous with profound, life-changing experiences. But I think it's worth noting that Saul was not really a changed man at that point of encounter. Bewildered, blind, but it was three days later, following the visit from Ananias, that Saul accepted Christ as his saviour. And that transformation was complete. It was a profound encounter. Certainly Saul knew, even there on the roadside, that he had been mistaken. Who are you, Lord? He said, when that light appeared. But I think it's reasonable to think that he might need some time to come to terms with what he had seen and heard. It's hardly a surprise that coming to a sudden, blinding realisation of the wonder and extent of God's love might take some time to process. Time which would allow him to be ready when there was an entirely different encounter, this time with Ananias. We often overlook the small things. This is most certainly a pivotal moment in the early church. Not only did Saul's conversion neutralize a serious antagonist, but in Paul, it gave the early church its most gifted traveling evangelist, spreading the message either in person or by letter to the likes of Philippi, Thessalonica, Colossae, and even Rome. But there are two heroes of faith in this passage. Ananias, whom we know virtually nothing about, except that he was a disciple in Damascus, is hugely significant. He heard God's voice and he was obedient despite fearing the consequences of going to see Saul. As a result, Saul was healed of his blindness and was baptised. Oh, that we would learn to value the small things, the things that so often get overlooked. The act of kindness, the encouraging word, even when we're hesitant or afraid. Saul's experience on the road to Damascus reminds us that God sees the potential in every one of us. But he doesn't always intervene in such an obvious way. We 
we need to be ready to listen to him. And sometimes, as with Ananias, God will ask things of us that we might prefer not to do. He might want to take us out of our comfort zone. And when we're obedient, great things can be accomplished. What is God saying to you? What is he asking of you? Which boots does he want you to wear? And which direction does he want to take you? God bless you.